Atopic Dermatitis 360, Real World Strategies to Improve Outcomes, ages 6 to 18, Moderate to Severe. I'm Dr. Lawrence Eichenfield. I'm a professor of dermatology and pediatrics and vice chair in the Department of Dermatology, chief of pediatric and adolescent dermatology at Rady Children's Hospital San Diego and University of California San Diego School of Medicine. This program is approved for 0.5 uh, CME, CNE, CPE, and AAPA credit hours. You can download a PDF of the presentation under the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen under the headshot. You will be directed back to the landing page after the webinar to complete the post-test and evaluation. You can then download or print your certificate. The program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an HMP company, and this program is sponsored by an educational grant from Pfizer. The learning objectives uh, are to discuss atopic dermatitis treatment approaches specific to ages 6 to 18 for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. To optimally integrate into clinical practice the biologics and small molecule inhibitory agents recently approved for the treatment of AD based on efficacy and safety data, to effectively manage treatment side effects, and to outline safety and efficacy data for emerging treatments for atopic dermatitis. So when discussing moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, I thought it's appropriate for us to just throw a, throw a slide up of a patient. And you can see this patient, this one slide is good enough for me to categorize them as at least moderate. I see pretty well-defined lichenification. I see the uh, erythema. I see superficial crust from oozing. I see, you know, a few percent body surface area already just looking at the uh, uh, looking at the arms that I can see, and I can see lesions on the trunk. I can see diffuse cirrhosis. And so this, you know, I'm going to say, okay, can I get this under control with topical therapy? But I need more of the history to know how severe is it, how persistent is it, um, is there involvement of the, of the face and the hands that are impact on activities of daily living, and these will be the variety of factors. Are there comorbidities? What have the treatments been, been done that can influence my decision of whether I'll be um, um, uh, potentially moving on from topical therapy to systemic therapy? But let's take a step back and start off with the prevalence of atopic dermatitis. We're looking in this age group in our moderate, severe, 6 to 18, uh, 18, up to 18 years of age. And so I tried to get some data that's looking particularly at our, at our children versus adolescents. This is a huge internet-based survey, shows a prevalence in the United States of atopic dermatitis in two to 11-year-olds of around 10% in the first few years of life. Um, you can have a higher prevalence than if you start to hit the childhood up to adolescence age group, it's around 10% or zero to 18 Population's about 9% in this, basically, um, um, in the U.S., but you see this variations around the world. But basically, when you're seeing a child six years to 17 uh, 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 plus years of age, um, you're starting to hit a, a persistent group uh, because some of the patients have had persistent eczema since when they were young, young children. In other cases, you may have childhood onset atopic uh, dermatitis or adolescent onset atopic dermatitis, and you're, but you're starting to get in a prevalence of around 8 9% as you hit the older um, adolescents. Now, one of the things we figured out uh, over time is that the, the traditional statement that there's you know, very, lots of eczema in the first few years of life and most kids will outgrow it is really an oversimplification. So studies such as the Paternoster study um, um, really inform us. So to walk through this, this was a longitudinal birth cohort that was looking at various disease trajectories, and the green line, you know, is the unaffected uh, uh, transients, but quickly building up the lines from the bottom up, you can see that they're, not everything is the traditional purple group of early onset, early resolving atopic dermatitis. In fact, there's early onset, late resolving, there's mid-onset that resolves, there's mid-onset that persists, and there's an early onset persistent atopic dermatitis. So for our discussion in this talk from our patients who were six years of age on to adolescence, 
you know, you're about halfway through the curve, you're going to have patients who are all, you know, who come from different spectra of um, when their disease started, and that's something to clearly get a sense of, because partially your knowledge of whether they'll, they're going to have more persistent disease over time is going to be uh, very much influenced uh, by um, the, a variety of factors, which include the disease onset. So if patients, you're seeing them beyond the age of four, and they had onset in infancy, that's actually a risk factor for persistence into later life. So basically the age group we're discussing, if they had early onset, that's already a risk factor for them persisting on further into, a, into adulthood. Um, patients who have onset outside of infancy also have a higher persistence risk. Those who have a parental history of ATP. And of course, throughout the age groups, the more severe the eczema, the more chance that there will be persistent uh, disease. Now, the characteristics of atopic dermatitis in our age group, uh, you know, pretty typical. We have our traditional, you know, we have pruritus, we have our eczema. Uh, um, in, the, in that six to 17 plus age group, you have basically partially childhood uh, presentations and then shifting on into our, into our adult presentations in our adolescence. So um, we've already moved on from most of the extensor involvement. Some six-year-olds will have that, but most will have established antecubital popliteal fossa involvement, often uh, uh, a wrist ankle involvement as well. Uh, many will have neck and facial involvement. That's seen across the spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, ages. And uh, so the clinical findings in our 16 to 18 year olds from a diagnostic standpoint are, are pretty fairly typical across the years. Uh, by what trumps uh, the presentation and the age is more the severity. So I'd say that our my uh, more severe adolescents look more like my six-year-old severe patient than variations because of their age. The severity sort of uh, uh, trumps that. We can take a look at these pictures and get a sense of what, in one case on the left, sort of a diffuse erythema with some xerosis, which is very different than the extensive inflammatory eczema with crusting seen on the feet, very typical facial dermatitis in uh, two patients and diffuse truncal involvement seen in the, in the bottom right. Uh, I'm always assessing the degree of xerosis and if there is uh, overlap in ichthyosis, the degree of lichenification also very much matters in my determination of uh, how severe the, uh, the patient is. So, Things that I do in this age group in assessing atopic dermatitis, say I have a new eight-year-old who's coming to the practice, I, I want to know what their history is of their eczema in terms of onset and course. I also, so I want to know if they had baby onset eczema or not. I want to know about the, the sense of dry skin. Uh, I want to know about other atopic conditions. It's very important in my, in my management uh, algorithm. So is it, do they have atopic dermatitis? Do they have food allergies? Do they have environmental allergies? Are those triggers of atopic dermatitis? So environmental allergies, dust mite allergy, for instance, can be a big trigger. Um, 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 and uh, certainly want to assess that. And then um, uh, conjunctivitis uh, uh, is an issue that may influence a selection of different therapies as well, as well as management um, um, and asthma as well. I want to know their current symptom complex how itchy, uh, how um, uh, are they up at, uh, uh, up at night uh, scratching. The primary and secondary findings, of course, of disease extent, we'll come back to that. And then I know that just looking at the eczema in one day isn't enough, so in my new, say, eight-year-old patient, I really want to get a sense of, of how they were a few months ago, uh, whether the disease is persistent, and, and pretty much in all new patients, regardless of the age, I will ask them, um, at what uh, time, uh, um, uh, when the last time their skin was totally clear. Um, about 40% of my patients go totally clear? You know, that's never been totally clear. And that's very telling to me uh, uh, to have persistent disease. That'll, uh, I'm going to say to myself, make sure I get to the therapy that's really going to give them long term disease control. And one of my takeaways for this discussion on six to 17 year olds with moderate severe disease, that the outcome I want is long-term disease control. And if I can deliver that with topicals, I will. And if I can't, 
I should move in into systemic therapy or phototherapy, which I, I, I as, a, as a potential alternative sort of in between, but we need to move them up to the therapy that's going to give them adequate long-term disease control. Now, there's different data sets that, that will categorize the population in terms of whether they have mild, moderate, or severe disease. Um, this is just one data set. This was a prospective uh, sample of zero to 17-year-olds, so but over 90,000 published by Jonathan Silverberg, had about two-thirds of patients with mild disease. Um, um, and then you'll see that there's this 33% uh, you know, uh, moderate to severe. And uh, we're highlighting, you know, in my discussion here, the moderate to severe population. And, and these are the patients, so you know, there's still a significant percent of them. I think many of them, whether they're moderate or severe, it would be sort of a moving slice of pizza size in this uh, chart because there are patients who are moderate sometime and severe at, uh, severe at others, and uh, that will move me to my selection of, uh, of therapies. So when can I say that a patient's moderate severe as compared to mild? And we know that assessing severity in clinical practice is very different than in, uh, in clinical studies. In clinical studies, we have our, our standard traditional official assessments uh, easy score is a standard, you know, that's the eczema area and severity index. And we, you know, uh, we score up the, the face and, and the head and neck as one area, the arms, the legs, and the trunk. And then we have these scores based on the, the, ex, the extent of the body surface area in those areas. And then the erythema and uh, uh, induration and population lichenification. And we come up with a set score of zero to 72. And so we don't do this in clinical practice. Uh, I can do one in about four minutes, you know, four to six minutes. It, when you first get started, it can take 10 minutes <laughs> to 12 minutes. So an easy score isn't that easy. We do have these bands. If you're, you know, seven or less, you'd be mild disease. Moderate seven to 21 is a, 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 a moderate, but a cutoff of 21.1 for severe. But we don't necessarily use this in clinical practice. In fact, I don't advise this use in clinical practice. It's consistent and, and pretty reliable, but just takes too much time and isn't necessarily needed. The score we use in clinical studies has a similar uh, objective measure. There's something called the objective, objective score, ad, which is just the objective measure of sign and severity, but the traditional score ad includes itch and pruritus. The POEM's pretty easy to use. You could use that in practice if you want. It's a questionnaire that patients fill out. It's the patient-oriented eczema measure. It's really reliable, but most patients won't do this in their practice. Um, body surface area assessment, most people don't do in their practice, but I'll come back to that. I actually think you should consider doing that, especially in your moderate, severe patients. And then there's quality of life scores, which we do in clinical studies, but not in clinical practice. So, from a clinical practice standpoint, I think most of us do a gestalt. Is the patient mild, moderate, or severe, which I wrote down here is the UOIGA, the unofficial IGA. Um, and, and a gestalt, I think assignment of moderate, severe is perfectly reasonable. But my sense is that, especially as I'm starting to hit moderate uh, patients, my assertion is that best practices are going to be that I'm looking at the, the extent of the disease the extent of the signs, in other words, what are the qualities of the disease as well as the surface area of the active eczema that I'm seeing, and then the severity of the symptoms. I basically always try to get a sense of sleep disturbance and uh, pruritus. Um, and then the disease course, is it intermittent or is it persistent? And then what's the impact? So, you know, how's the eczema impacting your life? You know, I'll ask my, my patients who are 10 plus, you know, do you hate your eczema? That's an open question. You know, may not be, may not be doing a formal quality of life assessment, but I'm giving, a, they're trying to get a sense of a window into how much of their life has lived around their eczema. And I'll tell you, having done this for a long time, that um, spending a lot of time with our more moderate, severe patients in this age group, what the amount of accommodation that's been done into their life or failed accommodation where the disease really impacts on so many aspects of their, their activities, how much sports they do, what they do outside, their relationship with their peers, their impact on school is just, just incredible. 
<clears throat> but don't be scared of asking those questions. You can do them pretty pretty quickly um, uh, in the uh, in the office. So my sense, and this is so one of my lines that uh, that I, I try to uh, I've come to believe is that the more severe the atopic dermatitis, the more assessment there should be. <laughs> so in other words, when I'm looking at the moderate severe patient and the severe patient as compared to the moderate, I'm going to take a little bit more time to assess the disease and a little more detail on what their concurrent atopic conditions are uh, about food allergies, if they have them or not, and whether they're real or just labeled because someone did drug testing on them, I mean food testing on them, um, whether, they had, uh, whether they have environmental allergies and whether that's been evaluated, do they have dust mite allergy, um, do they have environmental influences, for instance, uh, sweating and heat will trigger some people while humidity helps uh, others. Um, there, it's very important in this population to get a sense of what their evaluations have been in the past. Uh, have they seen other specialists? Um, what evaluations did the allergists do and at what ages? Were uh, eliminations done uh, empirically? Did they matter in their disease? In this population, the more severe the patient, the more you should take on asking these questions so you get a sense of this. Um, certainly in this population, I always think about allergic contact dermatitis. I don't test all my patients, but I think about it in all of them. Is there regional dermatitis um, or history of when they use certain products, whether they be moisturizers or uh, topical uh, uh, agents, topical steroids or non-steroids, and did they have a response that would make me think of potential uh, um, uh, um, uh, a potential contact allergy, so I know whether I need to step forward and do that testing. Mild severe patients, a history of infections is very important. Obviously, staph infections are usually important in this uh, in this group. Uh, finding out if they've had significant infections, if they've been on systemic antibiotics, if they know if they've had MRSA or not. <clears throat> Uh, history of eczema herpeticum puts them in a, a specific group um, uh, of more severe disease. Uh, that's important for me to know. Um, HSV is something I'm going to be thinking about in um, 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 treatment moving forward. I try to. This is a population if they've had eczema herpeticum, but they don't know what herpes infections look like. Uh, I'll sometimes show them pictures of. Uh, of um, uh, what grouped vesicles look like um, so that they're aware. Um, and then um, it may influence systemic therapy choice as well. History of hospitalizations is good to know. And then mental health, I'm much better now at asking about anxiety and depression. Some of my longstanding severe patients, I, I didn't realize they had been hospitalized for depression, just hadn't taken that history. And it's only when I specifically asked that that I, I got that information. ADHD is very common in this population, and behavioral school issues are definitely an issue in our more severe patients. So, so ringing in your head, um, uh, I want this sort of sense that the more severe the disease, the more your assessment should be, and uh, even in busy practices, it's reasonable to take some time to review that. Now, of course, we know this sort of circle of burden of atopic dermatitis, and, and, and this sort of... Uh, um, developed circle is my sense of the of this huge literature that's developing. If you start at nine o'clock, you know, eczema is about the, the rashes and the flares and the signs and symptoms. Those symptoms including pruritus, sleep disturbances around, you know, up at the top of the chart, which can have a huge impact, neurodevelopmental impact as well. Or atopic comorbidities, which uh, influence both the disease course for the individual um, nasal rhinitis, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, a, a big deal, asthma as well, or, or infectious comorbidities, mental health and immune effects, impaired quality of life, and, and, um, which includes daily activities, and then our social work productivity impact. And so in our population 6 to 17, we're starting to hit work in some of our teenagers, but their major work is often their school activities and sports activities. And, you know, absenteeism is a big thing, uh, as well as not necessarily being as successful in their work or, uh, or, or school performance. That, um, uh, and and eczema has been shown to really impact on that. 
So drilling down on impact, we know that 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 there are issues in terms of um, emotional distress and embarrassment, especially common as we hit our older kids and teens. There's bullying that goes on along as well. Um, the sleep disturbance can definitely uh, uh, have a significant impacts on the caregivers as well as on the on the patients as well. There was a recent study that showed that even moms of teenagers have disturbed uh, disturbed sleep associated with uh, atopic dermatitis and a well-developed literature on physical and mental health. So specifically in this population of six to 17 year olds, you know, we really have a childhood age group in our six to nine, depending on the kid, nine, 10, 11 year old. Then we start to hit our pre-adolescence and adolescence and their ability to relate their concerns in terms of the impact on school, sort of discussing anxiety and relationship to disease is different across this age group with the older ones obviously being much more cogent. If you give them the opportunity to discuss this where it may be sort of clinginess or acting out or behavioral effects in our younger kids, but there's this well-established uh, uh, impact on mental health. Uh, I do now, we do, depression screening in our in our adolescence as standard in our practice that's a you know um we have a very uh, a more academic practice but it's something i think you should in the more severe patients ask about anxiety and depression uh, you may it may not be that you're coming up with these issues uh, but you may be learning about these issues which may influence your um discussions about systemic therapy and also moving the family into systemic therapy um as well now, I've laid out sort of an assessment of severity categorization and a discussion of the impact on the individual. But I do want to go back to discussing body surface area assessment because from a practical standpoint, if you're considering systemic therapy, um, agencies that may be deciding if you can get approval of systemic therapies or, or payer groups or insurers, uh, many times we'll be asking for some objective assessment of the atopic dermatitis, both documentation of what patients have used and failed, um, um, which are many times are criteria for our systemic agents are going to be patients who are not adequately controlled with topicals. So, when a, you know, so a list of agents that have been used over time, but also objective assessment and body surface area it's actually pretty easy to do now. I've sort of changed my tune on this over time. While studies have shown that the most reliable across the ages is that the palm of an individual is 0.5% body surface area, I still think using a whole hand as 1% is, works pretty well. Now, this is the hand of the patient. So in a six-year-old, I'm using the six-year-old's hand in a 17-year-old, I'm using the 17-year-old's hand, which may be my size or bigger or smaller, depending on the teenagers. But if I, my sense is, having done this, is that if the patient has 18% body surface area or less, it's pretty easy to do that estimate with your hands. Okay? They have facial involvement, that might be, okay, that's 1%, you know. And I look at antecubital fossa bilaterally, that might be, you know, 0.5 to 1% for each. Antecubital fossa involvement, it's pretty easy to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, once you're above 10 percent, you're in, you know, you're in the moderate severe category. There are several groups that sort of tried to define, you know, basically, basically paralleling on psoriasis. What's the, what's the, you know, what's the cutoff for moderate to severe disease? And 10 percent body surface area is a pretty reasonable number. Although to be truthful, you have facial involvement or hand involvement, that may be significantly impactful and may be enough to give that categorization. But I think that sort of zero to 18 percent, and and the flip side, if someone's 80 percent or higher, <laughs> it's pretty easy to do that quick sort of hand counting. 50 percent is pretty easy because it's half the body. So if you're just looking at anterior, posterior body, you can get a sense if they're 50. If they're between 18 and 50, you can gestalt it. So I think that writing down a BSA makes sense in this population, it'll help you going forward in getting approval for some of our systemic agents. So in our algorithms of care, we have our sort of mild to moderate topical therapies where 
the light blue is basically, yeah, you have inflamed skin, you're going to treat with topical corticosteroids, all your alternatives, you're going to do that till you get disease control. And then in our moderate patients, we're going to be using maintenance therapy, either with topical corticosteroids, TCIs, topical chrysoboral, or a mix and match between them. You may be adding, adding bleach baths to their regimen, um, but there's going to be this mixture of then of flare control, but long-term disease control using maintenance therapy, uh, usually intermittently unless you need to do it consistently. If it needs to be constant therapy with daily topical prescriptive therapies, you'll be mixing and matching between your topical corticosteroids and your non-steroids because we don't do daily continuous topical corticosteroids. Standards, um, for this talk, we know for the moderate severe patients, you know, you can choose your your um, um, aggressiveness of um, uh, potency of topical corticosteroid. The older the patient, the more tendency I have to use stronger topical corticosteroids. And the more moderate the disease, the more I tend to use moderate rather than high, higher potency topical corticosteroids. I will use mid-strength topical corticosteroids in maintenance regimens, but I'll also use my non-steroids as well. Now, how much topical corticosteroids do patients use? And the answer is way less than what our standard articles and books have recommended that they use. It's because of a mixture of factors. Number one factor is steroid phobia. But in real life, I think what should be number one, but the number two factor is that we don't tell patients how much topical corticosteroid to use. Fingertip units confuse people. Most people don't go through the discussion with fingertip units. I don't even use fingertip units anymore, but I like to tell patients how much topical corticosteroid which they should use based on their body surface area assessment. And so, for instance, if you crank out based on standard charting and formulas, and we now have a topical volume calculator that we use this based on that, if I have a 10-year-old who presents with 50% body surface area on the body, how much medicine should they be using for BID application for one week? If you're a Q day, if you like Q day for your initial treatment, that's fine, just, just half it. But let's say the question, BID application, 50% body surface, uh, body surface area in a 10-year-old, the answer is actually 80 grams, okay? So an 80-gram tube should go in a week, okay? So this is just an example, actually, if it's a two-year-old who has 50% body surface area, it's around 45 grams, not that big a difference. So a two-year-old would be about half of an 80-gram tube in a week. For a 10-year-old, it would be a full 80-gram tube in a week. So I think this is a really helpful uh, number to walk around knowing. Um, and um, But the principle is that in this population, when I'm doing my trial of aggressive topicals, if they're a new patient to me, is I will direct them to use a certain amount of medication over time. Standardly topical corticosteroids, but it could be my alternative uh, uh, non-steroid Im uh, immunosuppressants as well, pimicolimus and uh, uh, tacrolimus. Uh, and then on my, my moderate severe patients, so we're discussing 6 to 17, realize that with the chromis, we're in that, in that group where 0.03 is approved until 15 years of age. Sometimes I want 0.1% and I'll write for it, but sometimes it's not covered because, that, because of the prescription cutoff being 15 years of age. And then topical chrysoboral is a newer alternative. We know chrysoboral has been approved in mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. It's used throughout the spectrum of atopic uh, dermatitis uh, in, in a, a clinical practice. Uh, we know it's a novel mechanism of action. The long-term safety studies look quite good, included two to 17-year-olds, uh, almost 350 of them. There was no evidence of uh, any accumulation issues uh, from a, um, a problem that occurred over time with extended use in six-month and one-year use in the studies and no safety signals, so it has uh, no limitations of its use, something else that can be used. We are, there are some evolving topical agents that may be relevant to the moderate severe population over time. There are some topical JAK inhibitors being developed for atopic dermatitis as uh, well as hand dermatitis and, uh, and topical topinarov and aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonists. 
The punchline for topical care is to treat to minimal rash, minimal paritis, minimal sleep disturbance, and long-term disease control is the option. But for patients who have more significant disease, more crusted eczema, more serious lichenification, or more extensive disease and persistence over time, we need to step up into our systemic therapies. That's when we move into the right column here. Our severe disease can be managed with phototherapy, now dupilumab. Other systemic immunosuppressors include our traditional ones, not used that much in the U.S. and not approved, cyclosporine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, azathioprine, and oral corticosteroids. Wet wrap therapies are a hospitalization uh, that can be used. And in our moderate severe patients, basically, I, I essentially use a, a, a standardized algorithm, uh, Eric Simpson, that put it together for the Inter Inter uh, International Eczema Council. Council. The patient has pretty severe disease. I know they've been adequately educated. They have an intensive trial. They have persistent disease. I've thought about um, allergies or infections that needs to be managed. When they still have persistent disease, then we're gonna discuss systemic therapy and or phototherapy as an alternative. In our six to 18 year olds, realize that these, most of these agents uh, are not approved. Um, the only approved is uh, dupilumab age 12 plus, and the dupilumab will highlight a little bit right now just because it's the only approved one. It may be approved 6 to 12 at the time you're listening to this. So dupilumab is really the first of the new systemic agents, uh, but there are others including JAK inhibitors that will probably be within this age group as well. So of this list, phototherapy is used. Methotrexate used to be, well, I should say used to be, it's the one that was most commonly used a few years ago when we surveyed pediatric dermatologists in the United States of the systemic therapies, but not used that much. Dupilumab FDA approved 12 plus, which really led our revolution to systemic therapy. So dupilumab is an IL-4-13 signal blocker, which is mediated through IL-4 or uh, alpha. Um, it has a, a dosing regimen based on weight in this age group of 12 to 17 of less than 60 kilograms of 400 milligram load followed by 200 Q2 weeks. Greater than 60, uh, the standard adult dosing can be used with or without topical corticosteroids. We know six to 12 year old studies have been done and, um, um, and that group is being handled as a group for uh, potential approval. It could have been even approved at the time that we're discussing this. The database behind the use of dupilumab in adolescents has been a, a well-published and discussed. Actually, the phase three a clinical trial showed that um, um, uh, patients um, um, in a 16-week trial had a marked difference from placebo in terms of the percentage of patients who made it to an easy 75. You see around 40% in this uh, chart to the left. Patients who made it to clear, almost clear, was only was, was in the, around the 20%, uh, almost 30% range. Um, so patients improved but didn't necessarily make it to clear, almost clear in this group. We do have some uh, longer-term studies. Um, uh, this is a paper from Michael Cork et al. of a group of adolescents who were initially in a phase two trial and then were in an open-label extension. This is really the first one year uh, data in an uh, adolescent showed about an 84, 85% decrease in their easy score. So patients basically continued to improve over time and then stabilized out uh, with a, a continued use. Now, the Pilumab under 12, we're eagerly awaiting uh, uh, the um, uh, approval. The side effect profile is presumed to be similar to 12 to 18 year olds. Little more issues in this population in terms of live vaccine. Um, avoidance. Um, so one of the live vaccines that are an issue, uh, well, MMR and varicella, second dosing is generally four to six years of age. So we're including this discussion six to, <laughs> uh, six to 17. So you might get patients who haven't had their second immunization or delayed. And so I want you to be conscious of this and just ask if their vaccinations are up to date before I'd initiate one of these one of these uh, children pre-adolescents on a systemic therapy uh, because many of the systemic therapies will not allow them to have live vaccines. Nasal flu vaccine is also a live vaccine and then uh, uh, yellow fever is another one, but it is, it is an issue. Now, 
There's the evolution of systemic therapies with JAK inhibitors. Uh, JAK inhibitors are small molecule oral agents. Um, there are these different receptors uh, at the cell membrane, uh, uh, the JAK1, 2, 3, and type 2 receptors that influence or highly, inf uh, highly influential in mediating the signals that go into the nucleus and impact on the development of a broad set of cytokines. And there are a variety of targeted agents that are being developed that are going to work on atopic dermatitis. Uh, these are going to be, as I said, these are going to be oral products. Um, they'll be studied both for, you know, several months course and then for extended course as well. Um, it'll be very interesting as we use our JAK inhibitors going forward to figure out how we use them over time. Uh, JAK inhibitors don't are not antibodies, so they can't develop drug to, drug antibodies. So we wouldn't expect that JAK inhibitors would work differently if you use them for a while and stop and then go back to using them. While with biologic agents, we get concerned that if you, people do a stop-start methodology, you can develop uh, drug-resistant uh, antibodies. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how these develop. And, and this very busy chart basically shows that there are a variety of targets for systemic treatments. I think all the systemic treatments, whether it be biologic agents that are targeting um, IL-31, IL-13, um, or, or different JAK inhibitors, which will be oral agents, or other potential products, including, you know, H4 receptor uh, 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 blockers. Uh, these particular agents are going to be developed across the spectrum of age of atopic dermatitis. In some cases, they'll do adults first and then go down to the adolescents and then to the children. In others, some of the kids and adolescents are being brought along into their fundamental, uh, 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 fundamental studies. But we're going to just have to keep an eye on this. Uh, but I'd say that the different tools that we have now has really changed our perspective on management of atopic dermatitis in this population. So rather than spend detailed time going through these particular, each particular Asian development, which is a whole other thing, we just have to be aware that these agents are coming, coming down the, the, the pike very quickly and that we're really revolutionizing our therapy, and we need to translate that to our patients and be advocates for our patients. So putting it together, six to 17-year-old, you know, up to 18, case by case, case by patient. In my moderate patients of six to 17, I want to treat to clear with good maintenance, care and avoidance of triggers and irritants, going to use my intermittent but regular topical anti-inflammatories. And then if I can't establish that therapy, I'm going to step it up. And my severe patients are basically, I'm going to handle them in an even more aggressive method. They get their, they get their trials of their topical care. I want to establish long-term disease. And if not, step it up. Step it up maybe phototherapy, but increasingly a systemic therapy. Systemic therapy right now, dupilumab has specific approval 12 plus, but it said it could be expanded at the time you're listening to this talk. No other systemic other than corticosteroid has a label, um, and, that, uh, and that you can consider either traditional systemic agents, methotrexate, cyclosporin, uh, maybe being used for um, a rescue therapy, but we don't have an obligatory step through of traditional agents, and as we hit our our uh, expanded agents, whether they be biologics or you know, oral JAK inhibitors or others, we're going to figure out which is the best one for each patient, depending upon their disease course, their history of prior therapy, and their preference. As we go through our shared patient decision making, which in this population is shared with the patient and the family, as well as the doctor, because these are minors who we're talking about, but with these tremendous changes, uh, uh, we'll be able to offer uh, really um, uh, life-changing uh, therapies for our patients. Uh, uh, thank you so much for listening to this talk, and I hope as you approach your patients with moderate severe disease in the SAGE group that you have a, a sense of uh, um, being as aggressive as we need to be to minimize the uh, disease impact on the individual over time.